Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Reynolds, and I'm going to help you sing and perform more like the top artists around the world. I'm a professional voice teacher, performance coach, and opera stage director. I've helped thousands of singers around the world learn the techniques and methods that got the top singers to where they are. Today we're going to learn from BTS performing Save Me. This is part one of a two video series where I put the live M Countdown performance next to the official music video version. It's two parts because in the M Countdown version, Save Me and I'm Fine are paired together back to back and I split them out into two videos because otherwise it would probably end up being too long. Part of the game here with these two videos back to back is to identify which video the sound's coming from. So look for the link down below to part two when this one's over. Here we go. A lot of times we talk about onsets being aspirate, glottal, balanced, and how important they are. Well, one of the things that's making the style here unique are the offsets, meaning how we stop making sound. In this moment, he's singing really aspirate, especially at the offset. He's sliding at the end of the offset. Duh! Try this sigh exercise. Yeah! Yeah! It's just a slight drop in pitch at the end. That's what's kind of giving the sound here. And it gives that kind of feeling, that emotion that goes with kind of a sigh and almost a melancholy feel to it, right? It's kind of interesting. It makes it less formal, makes it a little more relaxed and taps into emotions a little bit. There's no vibrato really here. It's really straight tone and really speech-like. Question I have here is you're hearing this ticking at the beginning. Does it really match an actual clock? Like, is it marking real 60 beats per minute? Is that what's going on here? Let's check it out. Let's try it here. Let's try it with a metronome. All right, metronome, where are you at? I'm gonna put a set at 60 beats per minute. Okay, so here's our 60 beats per minute. Let's see what, where this goes, right? One of the reasons I, I wonder that is because if that clock sound is actually faster, it's going to make us feel a little more anxious. It's going to give this sense of urgency of time speeding up of, and, and that's really going to serve that emotion. Even if it was right on, it would still serve that, that time's important, that it's critical, that something's going on. This kind of stopwatch sound is really anxiety producing for a lot of people. And seeing that we're talking about save me, maybe there's something to it there. But it's also a really cool way to just kind of set the beat of the song and also communicate that at the same time. Really subtle, really cool way to make that happen. Love it. At first glance here, it's really interesting because the live performance actually has movement that seems more muted to me. It's not as big. It's not as sudden. It's not as powerful in terms of its movement, what they're doing with their body. It's much more naturalistic, casual, and a little bit smaller in size. That's kind of different than I would expect. I would have expected that the live performance, they would be bigger and more dramatic because in a live performance, you don't usually have a camera right in your face and even as a performer this audience is out there and it's a bigger space and just psychologically most performers think about playing bigger when they're on an actual stage because in a film we can be really small really nuanced and have it still read to an audience but that's not the case here which is really interesting that brings a big question mark to my mind so in watching it a second time what I noticed is the effect was in the live performance is it made it more conversational. It made it more intimate, more nuanced, and it also made it feel more natural. And the gestures that they were using seemed more like conversational gestures than they did as 
really obvious stylistic dance gestures that we saw in the music video. So it's really interesting. The movements are really the same. The focal points are really pretty much the same. It's a really similar performance as far as they're concerned. But this difference in intensity, this difference in size of movement and explosiveness of movement really changes things a lot for me here. And in a way that's kind of unexpected. What can we learn from this? Well, we can learn that intent can change everything. We can do the same basic actions, but if our intention is different, if our focus is different, if the expectation that we go into that performance with is different, our purpose of how we're trying to relate to an audience or not, message we're trying to convey, story we're trying to tell, those things will change everything. They'll read. Even if the big gestures, the big body movements are the same, even if the words and the music are the same, what's actually going on in our mind, what we're actually responding to, what we're actually trying to communicate will still come through. That's really fascinating. I think a really important lesson to learn. Today, when you're thinking about your songs, think about, do I want this naturalistic or do I want it stylized? Naturalistic meaning, do I want it just like everyday life, everyday conversation? Stylistic meaning it's more dance-like or or you very purposely done the physical movement in a way that does not imitate everyday life type of gestures and movement. Sometimes it's a matter of sections of a song. Sometimes it's a matter of phrase to phrase, but decide, be deliberate about it and have control over your body and what you're doing performance wise so that you can make that choice and have it communicate and have it look like something that's on purpose. Here, both versions really read well to me. They look really deliberate. They're really consistent. They're right on point. Love it, but they're very different. It's a very different thing going into it. I would love to know what was going on inside their brain before they actually did both of these, because I think we'd learn a ton from that. Again, the game plan we have going into a performance makes all the difference. I know it, the crowd kind of gives away whether it's live or whether it's a music video. Eh. <laughs> so try to react to it before the audience does and it'll make it a little more challenging for you. As I'm watching it here, what this makes me think of is the principle of thinking ahead. Now, I know that sounds overly simplistic, but there's actually a lot of layers to it. Notice they're moving to get into position before they have to be there. They're moving at the end of the previous phrase, so they're in position to be able to move right when they need to on the upcoming phrase. That's important whether you're doing it in a naturalistic body language type of style or whether you're doing it in dance. That downbeat of the next phrase is much more important than the ending of the previous phrase. Not to say that they're more or less crucial, but our minds expect that someone is going to be physically transitioning at the end of a phrase showing us with their body what we're about to start hearing. If you don't think ahead and don't start moving at the end of the previous phrase, A, you're going to be late for the coming phrase. B, it's just not going to read right. It's going to feel like you forgot what you're supposed to be doing. It's going to result in this kind of pause moment at the end of your phrase. And it, it just doesn't look right. So they do an excellent job here of showing us how to think ahead and start moving at the end of the phrase to be in place for the beginning of the next phrase. Thinking ahead also means making sure that you are taking in the breath you need for the upcoming phrase. You're not just breathing because you're out of air. You're breathing for the length of phrase. You're breathing in the emotion of the upcoming phrase. You're really thinking ahead with how you're breathing. It also means to think ahead in terms of the shape you're going to need in your mouth. We want you to be in position for that sound you're gonna make first. Maybe not in terms of opening here and actually creating the sound, but in terms of the stretch and that suspension and the breathing mechanism, in terms of the stretch and openness here and releasing the jaw and tongue, in terms of even imagining what that sound's gonna feel like coming out there on that first note and have, making sure the vocal mechanism is as ready and prepared for that as possible means that when we do make that sound, 
it's not going to take us a note or two to really give our best sound, but it's going to be our best sound from the very beginning to the very end of the phrase, which is exactly what we want. So thinking ahead in terms of the vocal mechanism and making sure it's ready to make that first sound. Thinking ahead also means thinking about either the highest note in a phrase or the lowest phrase or both and making sure that our voice is prepared for that highest note or that lowest note before we get there. Not in terms of preparing or getting tighter tense, but in making sure it has its openness, the amount of release. We're imagining the sensation that we need for that highest note or lowest note well before we go to attempt it. So that as we go through a passaggio or as we start attempting to get that note, we don't have to be micromanaging and changing all these little things as we go up through it and try to attempt to get it. That's a lot, that's really stressful, it causes problems and creates all kinds of instability. But instead, if we start a phrase already in that position, then it's gonna be much more successful when we actually have to go there. So thinking ahead also has to do with planning on what pitches are coming up and what we need to do to arrange our body so it's ready for that. What thinking ahead doesn't mean is it doesn't mean getting tight or tense or anticipating or getting stressed about what's coming up next. That's not what we wanna have happen. What we do wanna have happen is to think ahead in the ways that we've talked about, but in a way that's relaxed, comfortable, confident. That's a matter of releasing tension and preparing and having your mind mentally prepared for what's coming up next. So think ahead. Don't let me do the same, same, same. Which of the two videos are you most engaged by? Which one do you find yourself watching the most? Now, those are kind of two different questions because if you watch them independently, you might be engaged more by one or the other. But side by side, one might draw your attention more than the other because of the lights or the movement or how it's done. So do think of those as different questions and not just restating the same one. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Comment down below. For me, I'm having a really hard time deciding which one is more engaging to me, which one is more successful. You could say, I like them both. I feel like I'm comparing apples and oranges here, which like I said earlier, is really interesting to me because they really are so similar. You watch the movements and they're essentially doing the same movement, the same dance type of setup, the same focus point in both videos. They're really, really similar, just kind of different backgrounds, but there's so much difference in the nuance, the intensity, like I was talking about before, that they're just so different. What I think this points to is that for really excellent performers, we want about 95% of the performance to be the same. That night to night, performance to performance, it's rehearsed enough, it's in their body, their mind enough, where they hit the spots they need to hit, do about 95% of the performance the same. So what's really interesting and where we see the artistry and the commitment of the artist to what they're doing and really making sure that they're connecting to what they're performing night to night to night to night and making it new is that 5%. And to me here, this 5% is so drastically different. It's so different. So to me, that 95% of it is the same and so consistent between live performance and a music video. I mean, music video, we kind of expect to be spot on and so perfect. The live performance, Am I seeing any error there that isn't in the music video? I mean, there, the music video and the live performance being so similar actually shows to me how consistent they are, how well practiced, how rehearsed. And then that 5% shows me how much of artists they, they are. They're not just reproducing the same thing, but they're finding new ways to connect with the same piece night after night after night, performance after performance, which is awesome. I mean, really, really exceptional artistry here. And I love it. I love that they are so different, even when 95% of it is so much the same. Love it. Excellent. 
excellent as always. For those fans out there, you'll notice that I had to take out a big chunk of the music video there because in this live performance, they had to take it out. So to make it line up and make this particular video more cohesive, I took it out there. Obviously, there's still a ton to comment on even with that out of it. If you want to watch the whole thing, the link's down below. Go click on it and watch the whole thing. It's worth the watch. Really, really cool. If you want a voice lesson, a performance coaching, or want me to work with you or your group to help you sing easier or perform at a consistently higher level, book a time with me at mrperformingartstudio.com. I look forward to working with you online.